Krista Karate, Business Crew Chief, Business Strategy in Racing. Work to live, work hard, and play even harder. Episode 9, All Mavens Branded Podcast. Krista Karate is a Business Crew Chief with the experience of a business strategist, race car driver, driving instructor, and an NLP trainer and master practitioner. Krista lives her life considering how she wants to make an impact and follows the European work model where they work to live as opposed to living to work. You build the life that you want and then adapt your job and income to facilitate the life you want to live. And as I said earlier, she works hard to play harder. I now bring you Krista Karate. You know what? I just started the recording. The reason is, is you and I have good banter and I want to make sure we capture it. So, sure. Absolutely. So, so, gosh, I went to your website and it said, coming Coming soon. soon. My question is, how soon? I got them some of the final copy this week, as well as some updated pictures. And so hopefully we're shooting for the first week of July. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well, I do see you on LinkedIn. Yes. That's where I send people right now. I'm like, LinkedIn. I do have a Facebook business page that I have been dabbling in since we've been in quarantine. So I dabbling? am dabbling. Yes. And uh, I've never been one for a real big digital footprint. So now Me that so many things are going virtual. I'm like, okay, it's time to do a website. It's time to do a couple of things and expand beyond the relationship basis of my business. Yeah. I've been expanding too. My latest expansion is I deleted my Facebook account. There you go. (laughs) And it's funny because people are like, you don't go on Facebook. I'm like, I go on it, but I go on it for business. Like I go to my business page. I don't scroll down through whatever else is there. I'm like, go to my business page. I I post there and there's a couple of other groups that I'm involved with. And yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I decided to take a stance. I've been studying this for a good solid year, and I do not approve of Mark Zuckerberg's behavior whatsoever. And I don't really care if people say, oh, I got to be on, I hate Facebook, but I have to be on it for business. I go, no, you don't. No. See, I think it's interesting for me when I connect with someone, I meet somebody at a networking event, and they immediately, within 12 hours, I get a Facebook connection from them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, Facebook is for like close family and friends in my book. They're mm-hmm. the people that I would happily, hey, it's your birthday. Let's go grab a drink or let's go grab dinner together. Or, let's just meet socially, period. And if you want to connect with me for business, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, exactly. And for to go grab a drink, that's what text is for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So I joined a couple months ago a social network called MeWe, M-E-W-E.com. Mm-hmm. So I'm playing there and okay. spending, you know, more and more time on LinkedIn. Yeah. So too. Krista, I am so glad we're on this, in this conversation. Me too. You know, because we have met several times on Mary Kravitz Zoom meetings. And I usually ask my guests to, to introduce themselves. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to ask you to do that. And we'll talk a little bit about Mary Kravitz and I'm going to find out. Well, let me start there actually. Okay. So it's like, so where did you meet? How did you connect with Mary? So I connected with Mary the first time at the leadership development conference here in Las Vegas in must've been 2018 through NABO, the National Association of Women Business Owners. Got she it. She was at that point on the NABO national board and she was here helping facilitate the leadership development conference that NABO was putting on. They do a uh-huh. regional leadership conference twice a year, once mm-hmm. in the kind of the Western part of the U S and then once in the Eastern part of the U S and then they have their large national conference in the fall. So since it was here in Las Vegas, the Las Vegas chapter, we hosted it, we got them the space, we helped facilitate it. And then we were able to, uh, to attend the leadership development conference. And then awesome. I connected with her again 
at the national conference, um, spent some time with her at the national conference that October, and Mm -hmm. then um, connected with her again at the Phoenix Development Conference in 19, Mm -hmm. uh, the Leadership Development Conference there, and just stayed connected with her. And when all of this hit, she actually was, I reconnected with her again when she was the um, virtual speaker at one of our local chapter meetings. Yeah. I love Mary. Mary Kravitz has changed my life. I admit it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you get to introduce yourself as you would like the world to know you. (laughs) I am a recovering corporate engineer. I worked in uh, my background, my formal background and my edu- formal education is in mechanical engineering, production and operations management. Mm-hmm. So I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering and I did my graduate work in production and operations management, which mm-hmm. is the nerdy way to say I have an MBA with the technical background. And That's very cool. Yeah. So I went and did what most people think you're supposed to do, graduated got a good job, worked for a Fortune 100 company, and realized that people say that they're like, oh, you're missing your filter. I'm like, no, I don't even know that I have somewhere to have one installed. So <laughs> I tend to speak my mind. And I love it. for some people that comes across as, you name it, crass, hardcore, whatever you want to call it. And I'm like, that's just me being raw, real, and vulnerable. It's, yeah. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. And when you work for a Fortune 100 company, they don't really like that sometimes. Some do. I had some great managers along the way that were helpful in developing that and understanding mm-hmm. how to better apply it in mm-hmm. a given in a given environment. And then I had other managers who were like, uh, yeah, no, that's not the mm-hmm. way we do things here. We've always done it this way or that way. And so after eight years there, I moved on. I actually went to an engineering design company and took my expertise that I had learned in the Fortune 100 company and employed them, utilized them in the design company and actually spun off a separate division within a couple of months doing environmental compliance for electronic products. And from there, um, moved out here to Las Vegas and dabbled in a couple of different things. The industry I was in was kind of absorbed by just the fact that there was a lot of intellectual property I needed to touch when I was working with a company to help them with their compliance. And Mm -hmm. a lot of companies said, yeah, you know what? We want to keep this in house. So the market kind of dried up. I went into actually selling wine because I was always good at the sales part of it. Uh And so I sold, I sold wine for a while. I sold funerals for a while. I sold life insurance for a while. And then I, man, you have lived, (laughs) you have lived. Yeah. It's kind of like, so what do you do? I'm like, well, it's probably a shorter list of what I don't do or what I haven't done. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I found that I was really good at sales and I was really good at uncovering what people really want to do, like the impact that they want to make, how they want to live their life. And more of what I like to say is kind of a European model of the work method where they work to live as opposed to live to work. Gosh, what's that? So, yeah. So that's where <laughs> you you build the life that you want and then you adapt your job and your income to facilitate and support that lifestyle that you want. Yeah, I like I like that. That yeah, that's so, kind of my li- that's my life in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to I mean, I've I'm a huge motorsports person, hence the Velocity Business Strategist name of my company. And I've been involved with cars and I've been involved with racing since my teens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to be given a hard time when I worked for that Fortune 100 company, used to be given a hard time. You know, I was the only person that would bring their lunch all month long or wouldn't go out to eat every Friday with everybody. I'm like, nope, you know, that money goes towards tires at the time, right? Yeah. And so... So what aspect I, what aspect of racing were you involved in? So I started with SCCA, which is Sports Car Club of America. That's road mm-hmm. racing. And I started out in a Toyota MR2. I moved on to a sports racer. Mm-hmm. And then I moved into formula cars. And so I have a formula Ford Swift DB1 that I've had now 20 plus years. I've had it a while. Oh, my gosh. And yeah, so I, um, you know, I've done it both just for fun. And I've done a couple of professional races 
Uh And, you know, one of the things when I was first out of college that I did was things like taking my lunch, drove a truck to work every day because I needed the truck to take the race car to the track every weekend, didn't need a fancy car off the track. And so, you know, I worked hard to play harder and I've continued that really throughout my life. Yeah. Well, we have several things in common. So I used to do street racing myself, Okay. but um, it was kind of illegal. Yeah. We've I all done tw- a little bit of that at some point. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I was 20 years old and I had a, a 1969 Camaro Z28, nice. which, yeah, I mean, it was, you yeah. know, a little different than modern cars, but the sucker redlined at um, 7,800. Mm-hmm. Had yeah, a hearse four speed on the floor. Yeah. So I could pull it sideways shifting from second to third at about 60 miles an hour. Yeah. Oh my God, the torque. I mean, you get up to about six grand and the thing just goes, throws you back. (laughs) Yeah, where you have the little dash plate that says, you know, you can hook a hundred dollar bill to it. And you say, if you can grab this when I shift, it's yours. (laughs) <laughs> and you can't, I've been in cars where there's that, that's on the dash plate and you're like, oh yeah, I got this, right? And then yeah. they, and they're like, okay, ready, go. And they shift and you're like this. And yeah. <laughs> there's no way anybody's ever going to grab that hundred dollar bill off the, yeah, off exactly. the dash. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When I was in high school, um, there was a Firestone tire factory mm. near my home mm-hmm. and it actually had a really nice, really smooth, really flat half mile, three quarter mile road on it. Yeah. And there were these really funny lines that if you didn't know what they were, you didn't know what they were. You didn't know what it was. <laughs> and there was a security guard and the security guard would only stop you from using those lines when it was time for the 11 o'clock shift change at night. <laughs> and so I yeah. had, you had a, you had your Camaro. I had a 66 Mustang with a 302 board out to a 307 fully blueprinted balanced, yeah, I was the chick with wow. the pool car in high school. Yeah. And um, my father, actually looking back at it, was very, very smart about that. Because. What do you mean? Never really had a problem with boys. Oh, yeah. You're like, too busy you know, racing. I never had to worry about that. Yeah. And it was such a unique car that no matter where I went in town, uh huh, everybody knew where I was. Yeah, <laughs> there was there was no because it had the, blue pinstriping and some pinstriping on the rear quarter panel. So it was like you'd park it somewhere and somebody would come up to you a couple of days later and go, oh, you were at such and such. And I'm like, yeah, well, long, they could also long before hear, social media was ever part of our yeah, life. Right? Exactly. <laughs> long before exactly. any of that was. Up. Yeah. But it also had a throat to it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I mean, oh, absolutely. Everybody in the neighborhood knew when I was coming and going. Everybody yeah. knew at school when I was coming and going. And yeah. I heard a podcast a while back about uh, actually the engineering of the Ford Mustang. They pay, mm-hmm. they spend most of their attention on the way it sounds. Yep. Yep. I mean, a lot of it, not most mm-hmm. of it, but a lot of it. They yeah. spend a lot of it. And it, and you know what? Throughout the years, uh-huh. it sounds phenomenal. Whether you do uh-huh. anything to it or not, it sounds great being bought right off the lot. Yeah, so I thought we were going to talk about business and strategy, but I am perfectly fine talking about <laughs> racing. <laughs> so the really cool thing is business strategy and racing, there are so many parallels. All right, here we go. I want to hear it. It's easy to talk about both, right? So yeah. everybody sees in business, they see the catastrophic failures or they see the people who are on top that are having, that have a phenomenal business, they're doing really well. Those people that are like, oh yeah, I want to be like, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, whatever, is they don't see all of the prep work and everything that needs to happen to get Mm. to that spot, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens in racing, right? You wrench on your car for 12, 15, 18, 20, 50 hours between races for the type Mm -hmm. of racing that I did in order to run for an hour and a half. Yeah. You know, it's all of that prep work. It's getting there. It's the making sure all the pieces fit, making sure everything works together in a cohesive unit to be able to run SECA races are typically 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the track, depending on where you're at, depending on the group size. So you do all of this preparation to run for 30 minutes. And you could do all the preparation right and your car could still blow up. Exactly. Exactly. And when you do business, it's like that, you know, so you see the success iceberg or you see the tree with the roots as, 
you know, what mm-hmm. success is or how success is, is established. And it's the same for racing and business, right? You do all of this work, all of the late nights, the early mornings, the miss this, the miss that, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And people really only ever focus on the outcome. They really only ever see the final product. Mm-hmm. You know, the same thing goes for yeah. any of your, your NASCAR, your Formula One, your Indy cars, you name it, motocross, boat racing, all of it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Olympic race, you know, any of the Olympians that we see, you know, the Michael Phelps, the basketball players, the Michael Jordans, we see them at the epitome and the pinnacle of their career. And not until the document, you know, the documentary is made or their life story is published do you really see the struggles and the tribulations and all of the effort and everything that was done to get them to that point? Yeah. Yeah. And the mistakes and the heartaches. Mm -hmm. and Right. I've learned over the last couple of years, it's not really the failures, but the times that they haven't gotten what they wanted and they get that feedback. Mm -hmm. The difference between somebody becoming successful and somebody really failing Mm -hmm. is when they don't take that failure or that feedback, learn from it and move forward. Mm. You know, one of my favorite quotes, and I believe it's Michael Jordan is, you know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. If you don't put yourself out there, if you don't take that risk, you're never going to get the reward. Yeah. Whereas if you put yourself out there, you take that risk, guess what? At some yep. point that reward will come. Yep. That yep. success will come. That you know, whatever you're looking for will come. But if you don't put yourself out there, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So in your business, what's your, what's your business model? What do you mean? What's my business? It's, model? It, it's emerging. I mean, obviously yeah. you're, yeah, you're so obviously a, skilled and have a whole lot to offer people. And I'm really curious about mm-hmm. that because I mean, you know, I, I love networking I love, you know, when I, when I have a relationship with somebody and that's Mm -hmm. what we're kind of doing here is, is like, yeah, I know somebody, you Mm -hmm. know? So what I do is, uh, it's a hybrid of consulting and coaching. Okay. So I affectionately call myself a business crew chief. So if you, as you learn about motorsports or whatever, someone knows about motorsports, they know that there's the driver and there's the crew chief, right? Okay. So typically I'll use NASCAR as an example. So and so is the driver, and so and so typically like, oh yeah, that's so and so's crew chief, right? So, what I do for businesses is similar to what a crew chief does for a driver and their team. I help facilitate how they're doing things, what they're looking at, wherever they're at, making adjustments and saying, okay, well, let's tweak this a little bit, let's tweak this a little bit, and let's keep your business moving forward. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I like the model of a hybrid between coaching and consulting. Really didn't Mm -hmm. realize that until about a year ago. Came from the world of engineering, came from consulting, where you hired a consultant to tell you how to do business. I've learned that it really needs to be a give and take, more so than someone coming in and saying, like, I'll use one of my favorite movies, The Office, and, you know, the bobs that come in. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you know. And so using that type of a model will get you so far. And until you really start to work on the people that are involved and Mm -hmm. mindset and, you know, affectionately say something like limiting decisions as an aspect of it, you really will only get so far. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I enjoy the consulting side of it to say like, look, here's the nuts and bolts of what you need to get done. And then let's work on the mindset of, knowing you can do it, how are you going to do it? And what are we going to change for next time? That's going to get us that much closer. Mm-hmm. Well, so I'm it's, glad you hear, I'm, it's good to hear you to also talk about the people. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it is, I mean, it part of the, you know, part of the reason Elon Musk is Elon Musk is Elon Musk, right? Part of the reason Oprah is Oprah is she's had an amazing team and she continues to work on herself. Mm -hmm. And her team and And, her team, you know, and it's not just a single person did this, you know, I mean, I I love the example of Formula One, Michael Schumacher and his engineer and his crew chief when he was at Ferrari, right? The best. I don't know the story. Um, So it's the best of the best. Like he was at times unbeatable. No Mm -hmm. one could reach his level. No one could do what he was doing. And then he retired. 
similar to Michael Jordan, he retired and then he came back and he drove for someone else. He had a different engineer. He had a different crew chief and mm. the magic wasn't there. Yeah. He was still good. He was still an amazing driver. It's just that little bit of magic was missing. Mm. And, you know, I'll use um, something that some people are more familiar with is Tom Brady and Belichick. Mm. They have something magical between Belichick, Brady, and the rest of the New England Patriots when they were all there, right? That mm -hmm. magic, there is something in that magic. And what I help companies and individuals and people do is really get connected with that Great. to move themselves forward and really get them to the next level. Great. Crew chief. Yes, crew chief. Crew chief and consultant. The business owner's the driver. I'm the crew chief and hire me and fire me at will. So... <laughs> That's Which awesome. Happens in the racing world all the time. And then they go back to what they know and they yeah. go back to what work and the same crew chief gets rehired again. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, in terms of leadership principles, anybody you follow? And I'll just say that I follow Simon Sinek a mm -hmm. lot. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I'm but, familiar uh, with Simon Sinek. I'm really good at concepts more so than names, to be honest. Okay. So let's talk concepts. Um, then. Concepts are servant leadership. Yep. I really, I really believe in coming from that place of service, coming from that place of heart. And as I said before, being that raw, real and vulnerable and allowing yourself to fail, allowing yourself to get that feedback so that mm -hmm. you can grow and move forward. Mm -hmm. So does Brene Brown come into your scope? Yes. I like Brene Brown as well. Yeah. Um, she's vulnerability. One I, yeah. I only, I know that one because actually all of the teachers at my daughter's school last year read her her dare book. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but yeah, I, I yeah. walked into the principal's office one day to say hello and, and talk with her. And uh, I was like, oh, that's an, it was a, to me, it was an interesting book to have in a school. Yeah. yeah. Just from knowing what I know um, about the education system. And she's like, oh yeah, all of our teachers, all of our faculty, all, everyone's reading that. That's our, that's our book this quarter. And I was like, that's really cool. Yeah, that's our that's book like, this quarter. Yeah, this quarter, exactly. And I was Which like, "Which means next quarter it'll be something else." But yeah, we're and I was like, "On that, that's unified perspective, really yeah, important." And that, yeah, you know, that's one that's of the things great. I loved about it is is that they, you know, in my background, I started just over a year and a half ago with um, training in neuro linguistic programming. Uh -huh. My business forward even further. And yeah, one that's of the, the uh, really, second thing we have in common. Yes. And one of the really cool things I like about the school that my daughter is going to is the fact that they teach to all four learning styles. Oh, they do. They awesome. do. And they focus on being able to do that. And I was like, so we, we really cool. know what those four learning yes. styles are. How, how, how do you represent them yourself? So there are visual learners, people that have to see it. Uh -huh. There are auditory learners, people that mm can just listen to it. You know, a lot of people who listen to podcasts are auditory learners. They can just listen mm -hmm. to it and it, they learn how to do it and they go from there. You have your auditory digital, which are your thinkers. They got to pull it internal and think about it. And, and talk to them. They talk to themselves a lot about it. I'm high auditory digital because my okay. mouth will move. Nothing will come out. And my husband's like, you're doing it again. You're talking to yourself. I'm like, I am. I don't even realize I'm doing it. And then there's your kinesthetics. Those that actually have to touch it, feel it, do it. And then they get it. Yeah. And it usually it's the slower. It usually takes those people a little bit longer. Sometimes. So one thing, and then other times when it is a touchy feely activity, uh -huh. as soon as they do it, they've got it. Yeah. True, you know, true. so it, it's yeah. really a, and there's, there's different learning styles and then there's different ways that you, you know, different things that you're going to want to teach in a different way because uh -huh. it's going to be easier. Uh -huh. It's easy to teach art in a kinesthetic fashion. Yes. It's more difficult yes. to teach it for an auditory learner mm -hmm. than it mm -hmm. is for a visual or a kinesthetic learner. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, I took, I went through the practitioners twice. Okay. And, uh, I was actually trained by some really very, very unique people. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, who did you train actually, with? Have I... With Jake Eagle, essentially, and Nelson Zink. There, okay. it's when I was living in New Mexico. Okay. And Nelson's claim to fame was he used to be a coal miner back east. Okay. And real bright guy, read a lot and kind of got him out of the, uh, got himself out of the coal mines. But his real claim to fame was um, when at the end of the Vietnam War, there were all these vets coming back with just a lot of problems. And he just decided to open 
an office and just start working with these people in terms of intervention. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if it was really called therapy, but he got extraordinary results in terms awesome. of helping these people. So I was trained with uh, Nelson. Nelson was pretty darn incredible. And Jake was really incredible. And actually, mm -hmm. Jake's organization in Santa Fe at the time was the NLP organization that was invited by the Japanese government to to fly over and train oh, them. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So for me, it's, you know, I people say, oh, do you still do it? And I go, it's pretty unconscious, but yeah, I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the big takeaway for me in NLP was that Jake pointed out that I was highly visual. So it's like, I'm talking to you right now and people don't know it, but we're looking at each other. We're just mm -hmm. recording audio, but there's all these visual things that are happening yes. in front of me as I'm talking to you. I'm still present for you, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. he pointed out to me, Jake pointed out to me one day, he says, you know, it's, you're really, you know, highly visual and there's quite a bit of the rest of the world that you just don't experience. Mm -hmm. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, kinesthetic, you know, <laughs> auditory. And uh, then I started podcasting. That was 15 years ago. So after listening to 4,000 hours of educational podcasts, I've, I've brought that into myself. There you go. But when I'm talking with somebody, it's, it's unconscious, but I can generally tell pretty much, you know, how they're wired, mm -hmm. and even if they're reversed. And I know you know what that is. Yes, but. yes. Well, and it's interesting, too, because when I went through the practitioner level um, training, the, our, uh, our trainer actually had it had us do it for two. We did it for personal and we did it for business. Oh, great. And people will be different depending on the uh -huh. environment that they're in. Uh -huh. um, not the reverse, not the, that part of it doesn't really change. What uh -huh. changes is, is, you know, their kinesthetic level for personal will be different than their kinesthetic for business. Yeah. And so it was really cool. Cause I did mine when I went through practitioner training and then I went all the way through trainers training so I can actually train oh, in Good. NLP. Yeah. I, I really just, I engineer, right. Auditory digital I fell in love with the science behind it. I was like, I yep. just am hungry for wanting to know more yep, and really how this is and how am I, and how do I show up and where can I use it to help improve my clients? Mm -hmm, and so it was mm -hmm. really cool. Cause I did it in practitioner. And then in November I went back, I was, I did trainers training and I went and I redid it and things had shifted. So it was the really training cool. had shifted. Uh, or my, you? I had shifted my, yeah. my yeah. four different levels had shifted. And what happens is the more you use it, the more aware of it you are yep. NLP, yep. you actually start to balance out and level so you can experience more mm -hmm. of the other four or the other three representational mm -hmm. systems. So that was really cool. Yeah, I don't know if it's still yeah. true, but it was said back then. That was back in early ni 1993, I think. Mm -hmm. It was that that in our culture, primarily, we're about 85% visual. Mm -hmm. And then 15% is made up with auditory and kinesthetic yeah. mixes. Yeah, I don't, I don't, we didn't get into that part of it. So, um, but yeah. no, it was, it was interesting. Our, our class was pretty well split between the four. Uh -huh. Which was really cool. So it was like, you know, when you did different exercises and that, because we were, not only learning the science behind it, but we would learn different activities and different exercises that we could use with clients. Uh -huh. So it was really cool that, you know, there were certain exercises where the, the trainer's like, okay, auditory digital has to work with a kinesthetic because otherwise yeah. if two auditory digitals get together, yeah. we'll be here for days until they, you know, <laughs> get out of their head and start to move forward. So I know. Um, I know. it was really cool from a, from a coaching and consulting perspective, it was really cool to see how the different representational systems interact with someone when you know yours and how you interact and how you attract someone who's like you, or you'll attract your, your opposite, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So let's just talk about I your ideal client mm -hmm. and so maybe even some of the, and I'll let you go off on that and talk about okay. maybe some, uh, a couple different case scenarios that, you know, were interesting or had sure. your attention. Okay. Sure. So um, I'm hired by companies and individuals who are ready for what's next. Uh, they understand that they're stuck. They understand that they've gotten to the peak of where, of 
where they're at. They've gotten to the peak of their abilities and that, and they're ready to take it to the next level. So um, how, how far into a business typically is that a year or two? Or, I mean, I mean, I'm sure it depends on a whole lot. It but really you... depends because I've worked with entrepreneurs. I've worked with um, salespeople who are just starting out. It's a matter of the client recognizing that they're at a wall or they're at a plateau. And it's more so about the individual at that point or the company culture than it is. I've been in business for six months. I've been in business for a year. Right now I have clients that have been in business less than six months. I have clients that have been in business for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I have, um, a client, I have a couple clients who are sole proprietors. I have a client who is a company of 45 plus people. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. They actually just added a new division. So they're, I'm going back in at the end of July to see where they're at, um, which is really cool because we met in August last year, October, they were talking about things. And then, you know, March, 2020 COVID hit and what is it? Six weeks ago. So mid April, they launched a new division. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so is there, is there a correlation with that time in terms of outsourcing as well? No. So they outsource nothing. They added another division. So they're a service yeah. company and they were doing mostly commercial business to business service and mm -hmm. they added a residential side of their business. Oh my gosh. And that's they're huge. up over 40% in the last six weeks. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I must be so, running around going crazy. It's great. I'm like sitting here going, this is phenomenal. This is what I've been like talking to people about saying, look, and you can't see it. Your visual, my Chinese yeah. characters here. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. People are like, what are those? I was like, that is the Chinese word for crisis. Oh, really? It, it is made up of two characters. One character is danger and one character is opportunity. I love it. And it's up to you as the individual, as the business, as a thought leader. It's your choice. Which one do you want to focus on? Do you want to focus on the crisis or do you want to focus on the opportunity? So that's Danger exact, and opportunity. This is exactly how I viewed COVID when the whole mm -hmm. thing started happening. People were freaking out and I'm going, this is great. Mm -hmm. Because partially because it mixes things up. All of a sudden the cards go up in the air and I actually am going to choose how they fall down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I, cause I have that power or whatever. Well, and you, and you have complete control over how you choose to react to any situation, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. you can react and respond as you see fit and utilize whatever tools you have to move forward. You know, mm -hmm. I have two clients who decided that, yeah, we're done. They stuck their head in the sand and they'll be lucky if they open their doors again. Mm, mm -hmm. And, you know, they sent me as soon as it hit, they sent me their, you know, hey, here's 30 days notice. We're done. Wow. And I was like, hey, you know, and I, I said, I understand that it is extremely uncertain times. And I will let you know that this happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about every eight to 10 years. It happens about once a decade. Mm hmm. We had it happen in 08. We had it yep. happen in 99, 2000. We had it happen in the 80s. We had it happen in the 70s. Yeah. And, you know, you've been in business for enough years that it's time for a little bit of a shift. Yeah. And they were Shake completely, up. they were, nope, we're just going to sell it and move on. And so now I'm in communications and talks with the new owners. So we'll see where that goes. <laughs> I was going to see what you do, sell the, sell the business. I helped set them up for sale. I was like, look, if this is what you truly want to do, uh huh, great. What do you have in place to be able to make this happen? Now, Krista, so. is there kind of, in business, is there kind of anything you can't do? I'm sitting there, I think I'm talking to a superwoman here. <laughs> well, thank you. Um <laughs> I will say that if there's something I can't do, I will either learn how or I surround myself with enough people that they will know how to do it. I don't do books. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. I don't do the accounting. I don't do the books. I've got a phenomenal, you know, six, eight, ten bookkeepers and accountants that I can send them to you. I don't do accounting and I don't do taxes. Yeah. But well, I will Bill set Gates, you up. Bill I will set you up to be able to do them. <laughs> Yeah. Bill, Bill Gates, you know, early on said, you know, he got to that place and he just started uh, surrounding himself with people that were smarter than him. Yep. 
Yep. And it wasn't just like generally smarter, but smarter in certain areas. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what you have to do. I mean, Absolutely. you just have to. Yeah. Well, and that's what, when you look at the crew chief, right? When you look at a race team, mm -hmm. not everybody's going to be good at changing tires. Not everybody's going to be good at making a camber adjustment. Not everybody's going to be good at, you know, engineering the car. Not everybody's good at putting gas in the car. You get to see where your strengths are and focus on those strengths. And that's probably one of the biggest things that I see business owners continue on doing is I'm going to do it all myself because it's going to save me money. And it doesn't. And it doesn't, you know, doing your own books, doing your own taxes, doing your own HR sometimes, you know, I mean, you get to 45, 50 employees and you need an employee handbook. You need certain things. You need certain things that in order to protect yourself mm -hmm. as a company, as a business and as owners of the business. You need that expertise and rather than growing it in-house, at least initially, if you outsource it, one, it's an expense that's going to help on your taxes. Two, mm -hmm. you have instantaneous expertise to be able to continue to grow your business and focus on what it is that you as a business owner do best versus having to say, okay, well, you know, now I need to spend in addition to running my business. Now I need to spend 12 hours a week working on HR. I need to spend six hours a week doing invoicing and bookkeeping and the accounting side of things. And then, oh yeah, by the way, I still need to do the 60 to 80 hours of running the business and doing my do that mm -hmm. I was doing before. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm at that place actually of outsourcing. So I hired mm -hmm. an audio editor. Awesome. Because I started, yeah, I connected to a, I connected to a service that kind of took all the work I've done in podcasting in the last 15 years and put it, kind of put it all together. And I kind of looked at it and went, really? I've done 1,354 episodes? Holy <laughs> mackerel. Holy cow, so, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I'm producing nine podcasts right now and I just don't mm -hmm. have time for everything. So, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's the, you know, and those solopreneurs, those entrepreneurs that are just starting out, you can find virtual assistants to help with some of the, mon I'll call it the mundane or the media work or the posting on social media sites, the scheduling of the posting sure. on social media yeah. sites. You can find a virtual assistant that will do that for six, eight, ten dollars $10 an hour. Yeah. If you could take, say it takes you normally five hours a week, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever you are as a business owner. Whatever mm -hmm. you charge hourly for you to do business, right? Coaches can run anywhere from a hundred bucks an hour to a thousand bucks an hour or more, right? It's 500 bucks an hour. You're a lawyer. You're doing this. You're 500 bucks an hour. I personally would happily pay somebody 10 bucks an hour to do my social media. If I could go somewhere else and make 500 bucks an hour. Exactly. You know, exactly. it's all about the mindset of yes, you're spending money. And you're spending money to make more money. Yeah. Well, a lot you of know, it is self-worth. It's like you have to establish what your quote unquote hourly rate's going to be or mm -hmm. whatever value you have. Absolutely. And, you know, in the case, like for me, it's like with it, you know, it's like I can hire an editor, train them if needed sometimes, you know, and uh, to put my attention on building the business and making mm -hmm. more money. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. Somebody it's really asked pretty me. Simple. Yeah. I was say somebody asked me cuz I was like, "Oh, hang on, I got to I got to get out of the house cuz the the house cleaners are here." And they're like, "You pay someone to clean your house?" I'm like, "Yeah, because for 100 bucks, they come every 2 weeks. They come with 3 people. It takes them 3 hours. They clean my house top to bottom." Uh-huh. And I'm focused on running my business. Yeah. I can make add a zero to that. I can make that in that, you know, I can make a 1000 to 2500 dollars in that 3 hours that they're cleaning my house. Right versus, you know, it would yep. take me all day on Saturday to do that. Sorry, that's yeah. time I want to spend with my family. I can make more by taking that time and putting it into my business than yeah. doing things like that, you yeah. know? So, you know, it's, and the same thing's true in business. You know, you get somebody to do your taxes, you get somebody to do your bookkeeping, you're having someone do your editing, right? Mm -hmm. How many hours, if you do an hour long interview, probably I would say a couple hours into the editing, you could do how many more interviews right? and how much yeah. more marketing when you have someone else doing the editing. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're a very valuable person to be speaking with. My Thank gosh. You. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, my friends my friends always jokingly say, hey, we're going to this conference or we're going to this trip. Will you ride with us? I'm like, sure. Well, now I've learned that I'm like, kind of need to learn to keep my mouth shut because keep giving my intellectual property away for free. <laughs> Oh. My one of my one of my really good friends. She's like, yeah, just stick her in a car for a couple of hours, and she'll help you better monetize your business. And I will. So this. Yeah. So yeah. So you're in, you're in Las Vegas. I'm mm -hmm. in San Diego. I'll drive to Vegas, pick you up, and bring you down here. And okay. I, I should, be, <laughs> should have a fa fabulous plan. There we go. So what What are some of the plans that you offer people? I mean, how are you the best for your clients? Mm -hmm. Actually, what's the structure? So there, so there's two ways I really like to work with clients. One way is individual coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching once a week, 25 to 30 minutes. And we really work on you and different assets and different aspects of your business. Mm -hmm. The other way is on a project basis. Um, that's more on the company level of, Hey, mm -hmm. we've got this, we're implementing, we've got this training we're doing. Um, I really like to work on companies on a project basis. And what happens a lot of times is I'll work on it with a company on a project basis and a couple of the people will be like, yeah, we want coaching on top of this. And it just moves everybody f that much for further forward ahead of the curve of if we just did the project, then great. We do the project, we get that rolling. And then I check in with them every couple of months, see how they're doing. I really enjoy watching the individuals grow, helping them move forward in not just their business. Mm -hmm. I also see them grow personally. By no means a life coach, I really want to avoid the drama and trauma and all of that. Although I know my coach says this, her coach says this, several people I know in the coaching industry say this. Let me see, I got to get it right now. The professional provides for the personal and the personal serves the professional. Ooh, so wait, 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 wait. Say that one more time. So the, the professional mm -hmm. provides for the personal and the personal serves the professional. Nice. So there's really no way to only work on one. Mm -hmm. You always end up working on both and you always end up seeing results in both. Mm. You know, I know for me, I went into NLP, I'll say for selfish reasons, I wanted it for me. I wanted to understand me better. I wanted to understand how I did things better. And it changed me. It's helped my daughter. It's helped my husband. I, I mean, it's, you can't do, we, there's no way to work on one without working on the other. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I enjoy working one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I will do group coaching a lot of times within a company and mm -hmm. then the, the project basis of, Hey, here's the goal. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Let's put a plan together mm -hmm. and let's execute that plan. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And then I'm slowly developing some classes. We talked about Mary earlier. I'm helping, she's helping me develop a couple of classes that are, uh, are going to be offered live a couple of times a year. And then I'm eventually going to have a self-directed program for those people that can be disciplined enough to do it on their own to where they can, they can take the information and build their business, adjust their business and move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward to spending more time with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So any, any last, uh, lasting remarks, any, I mean, a lot of people go, Hey, you got any tips? Well, <laughs> so I, here's my know. tip. Here's my tip. Okay. You have a tip. Oh my gosh. I have a tip. a tip. I have a tip. Coaching and consulting is never cookie cutter. It's never going to be cookie cutter. It's never going to be the same for you, John, as it is for Mary, as it is for Joe, as it is for this person. And if you ever decide to work with a coach and they lay out the program and say, hey, here's what we're going to do, run the other direction. That's my Great. tip. When you're is... looking to work with a coach or a consultant, especially a coach, if they come and they say, we work on this, we work on this, we work on this, we work on this. Yeah. A, B, C, D, E. Run the other direction. Okay. Because that's more about them making money mm -hmm. than it is about them helping you focus on improving what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm actually pretty much the same with setting up people's podcast. Mm -hmm. 
mainly, you know, I, I there's no cookie cutter for that. There, exactly. You know, it, people say, so what's the best microphone to get? Well, I mean, I can generally say, you know, and I'll tell people, if you're spending a lot of time on Zoom or thought about doing a podcast or going to be on a podcast, just spend the 60 bucks and get a Samsung Q2U, yeah. you know. Yeah. Just because it's just really a great mic. I mean, I would tell people that, but but it depends. I mean, well, on, it depends on what, on what kind of show, what kind of format. You know, where are you going to be? Is it going to be field? Or are you going to be doing remotes? You're going to have a studio, mm-hmm. your co-host, guest, blah blah blah. Exactly. You know, so people like, are like, what kind of business should I get into? How should I structure my business? Well, mm-hmm. what do you want out of it? Mm-hmm. Because people mm-hmm. get into business for all kinds of different reasons. Yeah. There is exactly. no. I mean. Ultimately, we all want to make money, right? That's why you get into business, but you get into business. You talked about Simon Sinek. You get into business because of your why. You get into it because of this is what you're motivated towards. This is what you're passionate about. Yep. And how you feed that is different for every person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing what I'm doing because I love the conversation and I learn so Mm -hmm. much from people. And I, you know. I really want to thank you. So, Krista, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you now? It's got to be LinkedIn at this point, doesn't it? Yeah, like right now today. it's LinkedIn. It's absolutely LinkedIn. And, and so, what do they? What what should they look for? You want to spell so, your name? In? So it's LinkedIn forward uh, LinkedIn dot com forward slash in forward slash Krista K R I S T A Crotty C R O T T Y. You can also I have a company page which is forward slash company forward slash V is in velocity, B is in mm-hmm. business strategists, S-T-R-A-T-E-G-I-S-T-S. Okay. So was that for the auditory NLP years? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then if, you know, if you, uh, my website will be up in July ish, okay. I'm hoping okay. that's, uh, that's the plan. I do have a Facebook business page, Velocity Business Strategists on Facebook. It's again, shortened to VB Strategists. Okay. And then um, I'm always open for a text, a phone call. My direct number is 702-677-6923. I am in the Pacific time zone. For some reason, people like to put Nevada in mountain time zone. I'm in the Pacific time zone, and my okay. ringer is typically on between 8 and 4-ish. Really depends okay. on the day, but eight. if you get the time zone wrong, that's okay because I won't answer the phone if it doesn't ring. So, <laughs> I actually have one last question I sure. usually ask people, which could extend this episode, but we'll see. Or we could just do another one, too. Let yeah, we marinate. could do another let one. It, let but, it marinate with your with your listeners and go from there. So what's the question? Okay, so yes, yeah, so let's do another episode. And what I want you to think about is kind of like, because this is going to be on the branded podcast. Okay. And we're going to be talking about, we often talk about branding. Okay. So I, I want you to think about it because I know, okay. you know, you started out as an engineer. So I, you're going to engineer this one, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> so... So, yeah. And then um, also pick a pick a subject. And for people listening, it's just like you've heard this episode. What would you like to know from Krista? Mm-hmm. You know, so you can always get a hold of us if you just go to all maven dot agency forward slash branded. It'll go to the podcast site and there's a place to contact us. But what were you going to say? I was going to say I would say as far as marketing, you really need to understand where you want to go, whether it's you Is it going to be bigger than you? Is it going to be your business? Are you Mm -hmm. always going to be part of the business? Mm -hmm. Or do you want it bigger than yourself? Mm -hmm. One of the mistakes I see people make in business is I'm going to make it Krista Karate Consulting or Krista Mm -hmm. Karate Coaching. And then they decide to move into having coaches, having their own coaching program, developing coaches. And then what do they do? Right. You know? Yeah. Just like you did. You've got your All Maven Maven podcast because it's bigger than you. It's not just exactly. you. So exactly. that would, I would say that we can talk more about that on the next episode. Okay. Great, Krista. So I will be talking to you soon. Thanks for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. It was good to see you. I'm sure I will see you next week. Yes, you will. Okay.